This week on Act Out, good news from the Grand Canyon and the problem with looking at environmental protection as an indigenous issue alone. Next, updates from the fight against the Mountain Valley Pipeline and new research that shows just how important stopping the fracking industry really is. Finally, Iranian-American peace activist Leila Zan joins us to talk about the situation in Iran and recent developments. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to Act Out. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. We start today, believe it or not, with some good news. Last week, the House Natural Resources Committee gave preliminary approval to bills which ban mining on a million acres around the Grand Canyon, taking uranium off of the list of quote-unquote critical minerals and setting a 10-mile mining buffer around Chaco Canyon. The list of these 35 critical minerals was formed under executive order by Trump so as to essentially ensure a steady stream of destruction and exploitation. Destructive mining for the other 34 minerals aside, uranium in particular has a sordid history in the region which we've covered on this show before. Open pit mines still dot the landscape, many totally unmarked and even unknown, leaching toxins into land and groundwater. People living in these areas, in particular indigenous communities, experience cancer rates many times higher than the national average. In short, this represents yet another perpetuation of colonialist violence in the name of capitalist profit. And while lawmakers are already pessimistic about the outcome of these mining ban bills in the Senate, it is incredibly important that we not only cover this, but recognize the vital work that folks in this region have done for many, many years, again, particularly in indigenous communities. And this also raises another point. Earlier this year, indigenous news outlet Intercontinental Cry reported that guaranteeing indigenous land rights and forest management has been shown time and again to offer more biodiverse forests with higher carbon storage levels than any other conservation effort. In short, as the headline to this article reads, if you want to protect the forests, you have to protect the people. Indigenous peoples around the world put their bodies on the line in order to protect land, water, and air. They are the most targeted by both corporate and state violence simply for refusing to die in an oil slick. I mean, it really begs the question here. How the fuck did we get to this point? How the hell did we get to the point where any human being sees themselves as plucked from the ecosystems in which we live? It really is really is quite extraordinary if you think about it for a second. Every breath that you take, Every piece of food that you eat, certainly every sip of water, is part of everything that we have done and do to this air, this land, this water. You can't put a filter between yourself and large-scale planetary destruction. Britta can't fix that for you. And yet even those of us who recognize the work of these frontline communities still tend to place a demarcation line. We separate ourselves from the indigenous and see ourselves as needing the land, the air, and the water just a, just a little bit less than they do. We consider ourselves to be allies when we work on environmental issues, as if we somehow don't need access to the same building blocks of life. And this isn't some we're all indigenous rant where I throw a dream catcher up on a screen and sing a song. No, no, no. This is a mere point of perspective. The longer we see indigenous communities as needing access to a livable future more than we do, the longer we can put off our own engagement the longer we can consider their lifestyles as primitive rather than necessary and a necessary lens through which to view our place in these ecosystems. The longer we do that, the longer these ecosystems will suffer. And it follows that we will suffer. The longer we see fresh water as a good investment, a la this recent New York Times article, the longer we will treat it like a disposable commodity. Indeed, there are water mutual funds. Let that sink in. This article goes into detail about how water regulations can oftentimes stand in the way of a good profit margin, but 
big investors are finding creative and very lucrative workarounds. For instance, in the United States, betting on the price of water requires buying land that has water rights associated with it. Harvard University's endowment, for example, has bought up California vineyards and thus acquired control of their water rights. So if you're thirsty in California, you may have to haggle with Harvard for a glass of water. Meanwhile, investment site The Balance recently wrote an article which uh, looks to coach folks on how to invest in water, writing, quote, water is a commodity that can be traded with ETFs like oil and gold. Although water covers two thirds of our planet, only a fraction of it is available for drinking for a world population that exceeds 7 billion people. Fortunately, this article can make it easier to invest in the best water funds than it is to find good water. I have to say I was a little shocked when I read that to just be so upfront about how some 7 billion people need water, which they can't get. But if you're one of the small percentage of jack dicks lucky enough to have the time and money to read this blog, you can be the proud and exclusive owner of life-saving water and watch everyone else either die of thirst, drown in toxic sludge, or hey, why not both? At no point is there any hint of consideration for the causes of dwindling fresh water, like like they talk about it like it's inevitable, just like capitalism, just like racism and poverty and sexism and war. That's just how it is. That's life. But no, that's death. And at some point, no amount of ETFs are going to save these assholes from the onslaught of climate change, bolstered and amplified, of course, by human actions. Truly, what's missing here isn't empathy. It's not charity. What's missing is simply a base understanding of what the fuck a human being is. And the longer that we pretend that we are above the millions of years of evolution that demand a healthy ecosystem to survive, the faster we will fall. And that's not identity politics, that's science. This past weekend, more than 30 water protectors stopped work on the Mountain Valley Pipeline in Cove Hollow in Virginia. You may recall that we've covered this dirty energy project before on the show, speaking with tree sitters who, to this day, continue to put their bodies directly in the line to protect land, air, and water. Sunday, July 21st marked the 320th day of tree sits. Soon after the work stoppage blockade ended, where no arrests were made, police randomly and aggressively arrested three protectors just beneath the tree sits. As reported by a witness at the scene, the cops pulled in, got out of their cars, straightened their belts, and then four to five cops tackled our friend in the road where she was taking pictures, entirely off the easement and out of the limit of disturbance. After that, two other folks were also arrested. At least one of them was also tackled. And as captured by a photographer at the scene, officers aggressively handled the protector and tightened the zip tie cuffs to the point of immediate swelling. To get more updates and to support this vital work of blocking and stopping a fracked gas pipeline, check out Appalachians Against Pipelines on Facebook as well as on Instagram, and donate via bit.ly slash support MVP resistance. The importance of these blockades cannot be overestimated. As we covered in last week's episode, a U.S. fracking boom is demanding the construction of new pipelines, despite the fact that we already have millions of miles of fracked gas lines already. And while pipelines themselves are really nothing more than ticking time bombs of explosively toxic proportions, the fracking boom itself represents hundreds of years of literally earth-shattering consequences. A new report by the U.S. Geological Survey shows that oil wastewater disposal from oil and gas production may cause earthquakes for decades, even after operations are reduced. The cancer-causing chemicals and radioactive material left behind in the wake of fracking operations are the number one cause of unnatural or human-caused earthquakes. In Oklahoma alone, where the industry is booming, there has been a 4,000% increase in earthquake activity in the past 11 years. The research shows that even after fracking operations cease and small-scale earthquakes subside, larger earthquakes may occur more often. Because fluid pressure continues increasing at these depths for over a decade after significant SWD rate reductions, 
Our study implies that even though earthquake frequency may decline after reduction of SWD injection rates, the sinking wastewater may induce larger earthquakes. Cool. Must be doing wonders for groundwater. And I think we can all agree that the only thing worse than an earthquake is an earthquake via toxic radioactive chemicals. Put simply, blocking pipeline construction puts a direct press on fracking operations. And of course, the ongoing efforts to stop and block fracking projects themselves is crucial as well. Tactically speaking, there is a lot to do and a lot to consider. And for those interested in seeing where you might be able to help out, even in your own communities, fracktracker.org hosts a map of ongoing fracking projects. And sadly, there's no shortage of targets. Finally today, we turn to Iran. A couple of weeks ago, Iran surpassed the threshold for enriched uranium originally agreed upon in the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as the Iran nuclear deal, which, if you'll recall, Trump tore up, really just to spite Obama, because America. Of course, U.S. corporate media jumped at the chance to cast Iran as this evil nuclear power goading the peaceful Uncle Sam into war. However, this, much like most everything else corporate media says, is total bullshit. And as extremist dipshits like Pompeo and Bolton push for more war in the Middle East, activists and experts in both Iran and the U.S. are setting the record straight and calling on U.S. residents in particular to see behind the propaganda and mobilize for peace. Here to talk more about the situation in Iran and recent developments is Iranian-American peace activist Leila Zand. Take a look. So... Last Friday, the House voted 251 to 170 to keep Trump from waging an unauthorized war against Iran. And I'm curious how this affects the authorization to use military force uh, that has been used to continue to wage wars in the Middle East and how this, if it could help to stop war. I personally believe this is a tremendous um, success. Uh, to know that someone like Trump, never we can trust his ideas and his thoughts, so we can some there is something that can control him. This is wonderful. But at the same time, we have the experience uh, with um, you know previously with other nations. Even for example, I remember during the Iraq War and the uh, the time um, before the invasion of 2003, actually United States and. Um, Britain, they had this conversation that if they could uh, make Saddam Hussein to shoot one of the planes that has a UN sign on it in order to get involved with the war. So we still have this danger. And also, of course, uh, I mean, people say sanctions, but really it's economic warfare because sanctions suggest that the country did something wrong. Um, so really the, the economic warfare continues and Trump has threatened to raise sanctions. I mean, I don't know how he could do that. There just seems to be no headroom left. Yeah. And, uh, sanction is really bothering a lot of people. First, we should just keep in mind sanction cannot be a policy and is not a policy. Sanction is something that often the um, government used it against other countries, other governments, in order to um, prevent any kind of military actions or ask for that government to do something, for the enemy government, quote unquote, to do something. And um, But unfortunately, there is no specific and clear strategy, clear demand from Trump administration for the sanctions that they are putting Iran into. For example, one of the 12 demands or 12 no, um, sections that uh, Trump administration suggests that basically um, in one sentence we can say they are asking uh, Iran to just hand the country, Iranian government to hand the country to Trump administration and say we are leaving. So basically is truly regime change. Um, when I look at Iran and I was in Iran last summer and I see how people and they are suffering in their daily life for what they need, for bread and butter, for bringing for their kids. So, and this is only small part of those sanctions. It's part part of the um, impact that those sanctions has on people, there are a couple of things we should keep in mind that often in a difficult condition, the most vulnerable suffer most. So poor people, women, children, elderly, sick people, so they mostly suffer. And then 
besides that, when I look at as an, you know, as an Iranian American, I go there and I look at people and I interview people and I talk to people. I see what we see in the surface. For example, the bread's price is high. This is only the surface. The country, the population is suffering tremendously. And that is not for this generation, even for the next generation. This is a psychological impact that is going to have on people. People, the parents, for example, who have, who cannot, who has to choose between uh, providing uh, medicine for her kid to save her life or uh, eat daily food. So it's, it's very difficult for that people. And I also wanted to ask you, because this is something that... Um... A, re a recent development as well. Uh, Iran bypassed the enriched uranium limit that was originally agreed upon in the JCPOA, which of course uh, Trump then completely ripped to shreds. Um, and a lot of people might not know that the JCPOA wasn't just between the US and Iran. There were several other countries involved, particularly in Europe. Was this kind of a signal to Europe that, you know, you need to stand up to the US and stop them from bullying? Or, or how do you think that's being read in Iran? First of all, I should add that it was not only between, you are right, not only between U.S. and Iran, and even it was not only between a couple of countries in Europe and Iran. It was kind of international. The EU, the five plus one, you know, including China and Russia and Europeans and United Nations, everybody accepted that. And Europe tried to make some facilities, but they were not successful. And Iranians were very unhappy about that. So they started to go back steps that they already closed down some enrichment programs and other programs. They started to go back to what they had prior to 2015. Um, but at the same time, when I um, look at the observers who know about how to make nuclear bomb or nuclear weapons, They everybody talk about that Iran still has a long way and even going back to some of these um, uh, enrichment level that they had before, still Iran has a long way to get to what, um, you know, Trump is, Trump or for that matter, Isla Israelis and Saudis and, you know, people in the region, they are thinking that Iran is going to get. And also we need to really remember that Iran always have said they are not going for nuclear weapon. They are going for nuclear energy, which is a huge difference. Yeah. And and, and another interesting thing is that if you look at, power, at countries that have nuclear weapons, they find a way to do it. And it seems to me that if Iran really wanted a nuclear weapon, they would have done it by now. Exactly. Exactly. They they had the ability. They could do it. They if they wanted. Exactly. So do you so do you think that this uh, this is kind of more of a, a a show to the 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 rest of the world that the rest of the world needs to stand up to the U.S. or, or how do you think that that is? You know, so far Iranian are saying are screaming that we want to negotiate. We want to solve these problems from the um, political with the political approach. Iran has been around for four thousand years. It doesn't matter what regime has, uh, you know, run the country, but this is the Iranian way. They want to survive, and it's, I'm not talking about the regime. I'm talking about that, you know, geopolitical region that uh, that we call it Iran today. They want the country wants to survive, and one way to for survivance is, of course from the uh, diplomacy route. And Iran wants to do that. By going back to what Iran had done previous to 2015, basically Iran wants to um, have its voice to be heard. But answering your question, I would say, yes, Iran wants to be heard. Um, it kept quiet for almost a year. Trump administration came out of the deal last year, last May 2018 and Iran want to get their attention and uh, because they are suffering. Iranians are suffering. I'm curious, to, from the outside looking in, it seems to me that because of that long-standing history, the 4,000 years, there's a lot of resolve. But as you mentioned, there's also a strong desire desire for peace. Um, do you feel that the has the, the feeling amongst uh, Iranians changed a lot over the past few years? 
I can answer probably this question from many different perspectives. It's um, historical, cultural, psychological, or their view toward the United States is if it has changed or what people are saying these days. So when I, I talk to my friends, for example, the other day I was talking to a, to a friend of mine who is an scholar. She has published many books. Um, and she, like me, like many other Iranians, she they are not happy. We are not happy. And she was not happy with the Iranian regime and many of the, their domestic policies. But she was telling me that we are mostly mad at Americans and Europeans because they took away, they promised, they came and they were so happy. Iranians, everybody were so happy. The economy showed tremendous, in, uh, you know, increase in their um in the nation in general, and in 2016 and 17, and when Trump came out of the uh, deal, so it started to just showing the negative impact immediately. So I want to say a lot of people, if they are angry, although they are not happy with their Islamic Republic, but still they point out at um, foreign countries. It's ironic because you mentioned that uh you know, that that they are they're not happy with the Iranian government, but they understand that it's almost like because of the U.S. intervention and because of of us not letting Iranians be, they can't actually deal with their own government. So we're actually stopping Iranians from being able to address their government. Exactly. And this is really um, obvious, especially on specific movements like women movements that I follow often. So many of my friends in a women's movement, they decided to just keep quiet and sit back because they feel that of the threat of to their country. They don't want to just add to the misery of the people. They said we have foreign threat right now next to our in an Iranian expression, we say behind our ear. So the threat is very close to us. So we don't want to just add to it and we don't want to do something that other um, oppositions to Iran, like either the Americans or American government or um, other oppositions, Iranian oppositions who are supported by American governments, like Mujahideen Ehav, MEK group, or a terrorist organization, they use this. They use us and our movement for their own benefit. So many of them are just keep quiet and sitting back and waiting for something to change. Yeah, which is so, I mean, it's so ironic. Uh, but of course, that it, it speaks to the idea that the U.S. doesn't isn't really concerned with the quality of life for Iranians. They're concerned with their own imperialist uh, uh, hegemony. Um, so sort of uh, wrapping up here, I, I really uh, like the work that Iranian filmmaker um, Marjane Subtrapi has done. And she she said a quote, which kind of reminded me of, of something you just said. The difference between you and your government is much bigger than the difference between you and me. And the difference between me and my government is much bigger than the difference between me and you. And our governments are very much the same. Um, and I, 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 I yeah, and I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Also, with regards to being a peace activist in both Iran and, and the U.S., how do you feel we can act upon that sentiment? I have a strong belief in that. I think, you know, when I talk to my American friends who don't know much about Iran, they get so surprised when they hear that I say I see a lot of similarities between this government and that government from the you know, these days we are in the process of election here. So um, from the election perspective, that who can run and who can go to the whatever you can imagine, to the relationship with people. The only difference is, I say always, it's like you are going to buy a bag of pistachio. And if you go to Iran, they just put the pistachio on the plastic bag and give it to you. But here in the States, they just put it in the box and a ribbon on top of that. And you think you bought something really precious <laughs> so, and very important. So this is the difference. Here is a little more chic, but it's the same style. I don't see much difference between that. Um, and I think that makes us to be more connected. And when I say us, I mean everybody in this world, you know, because we are suffering from the same root. And I really have a strong belief on what Dr. King mentioned that on triple evil, on militarism, racism, and economic exploitation. And I think 
that is what make us to be, to suffer, all of us, Iranians, Iraqis, Afghanis, and um, Americans, Europeans. It's because we need to have or find our voice here in our own country and also connected, to be connected with people to other countries. Racism plays a very important role in American foreign policy as much as in domestic policy. So this is something that can connect us all together. And it is important to know there are people the other side of the world that are suffering as much as we are. And it just may be a, different, a little different uh, from the um, presenting of that suffering, but basically the root and the process is the same. Um, I am happy to see that and there are some activities among um, anti-war movement and some connections with the um, with our representatives that it's happening. These are all great, but I also have a strong belief in education. We need not only educate ourselves, but also educate our younger generation to let them know another war means more disaster here at home, means less job, means less security. And the money that we spend overseas for another war, which Many people say, if you like Iraq war, you will love Iraq, Iran war, because it would be a war that it won't finish very fast and very smoothly, as we still are in Iraq after 15 years or even probably more. So my suggestion is try, you know, people say try to know your enemy, but we know those people are not our enemy. Those are the people like us who are suffering from the same reason for the same reason and from the same roots. We need to be in, you know, in connection with them. We need to understand their stories and we, and they must hear our stories and they must know that they are not alone. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Thanks so much for watching. Reminder, the best way to stay up to date on our work is to sign up for the newsletter at the address below. And please share this episode and all the others on all of your networks. To those who have donated, thank you so much. Please keep spreading the word in order to ensure our ability to keep acting out. Until next week, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, visit patreon.com slash act out. I'm not a